There are two laws that are significant to understand the basic refrigeration cycle in air conditioning. Thermodynamics first law explains that energy cannot be neither created nor destroyed, but can be changed from one form to another. Thermodynamics second law can help better understand how the basic refrigeration cycle works. Once of these laws state that heat always flows from a material at a high temperature to a material at a low temperature. Sensible heat, when change in temperature can be measured by a thermometer or when we put our hand on an object. We feel heat, that is sensible heat, latent heat, absorbed or rejected when a refrigerant is changing state from liquid to gas, or vice versa, however, the temperature remains the same. Heat is known to add to refrigerant but does not register in a thermometer, it just changed the refrigerant state, gas to liquid, or vice versa. This is also known as hidden heat. The refrigeration cycle explains what is happening to the AC freon in each of the four components within the system. Vapor compression refrigeration system. 1. Compressor. 2. Condenser. 3. Expansion valve. 4. Evaporator. The compressor is the heart of the vapor refrigeration system cycle. The low pressure, low temperature, vapor refrigerant gas enters into compressor through suction line from evaporator. Compressor. Convert this gas into high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant and it goes into condenser. Through this charge line, condenser, high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant enters into condenser through this charge line. In condenser latent heat, project to the atmospheric air from vapor refrigerant and it converts into liquid refrigerant without changing its sensible heat. This high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant goes to expansion valve through liquid line. Expansion valve, high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant enters into expansion valve and here it converts into low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant due to control the flow and it goes to evaporator. Evaporator, low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant enters into evaporator, here again refrigerant absorb the latent heat from enclosed area or substance and it converts into vapor. Now low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant goes to compressor through suction line. Again same cycle repeat. Simple way of refrigeration cycle explanation. The low temperature and low pressure refrigerant enters the compressor and becomes a high temperature and high pressure gas after compressed, then enters the condenser from compressor, and exchanges the heat with cooling water in the condenser. The high pressure liquid refrigerant after cooled by the condenser is throttled soon in the expansion valve, and then enter the evaporator after temperature and pressure reduction. The refrigerant is evaporated in the evaporator and takes use of latent heat to make the chilled water temperature decrease and thus achieve cooling. The refrigerant gas enters the compressor and begins the next cycle. There are three different three types of chillers. 1. Air-cooled chiller. 2. Water-cooled chiller. 3. Evaporative condensed chiller. Compressor specifications. There are basically five types of air conditioner compressor that are commonly used in the HVAC industry. Reciprocating, scroll, screw, rotary, centrifugal, reciprocating. A reciprocating compressor works by moving a piston in a cylinder wire connecting rod and crankshaft. If only one side of the piston is used for compression, it is described as single acting. If both sides of the piston, top and underside are employed. During the up and down stroke, it is defined as double acting. A scroll compressor has one fixed scroll which remains stationary and another moving or orbiting scroll that rotates through the use of a swing link. When this happens, 
The pockets of refrigerant between the two scrolls are slowly pushed to the center of the two scrolls, causing the reduction of the volume of the gas. What are rotary air compressors? Rotary air compressors are regarded as the workhorses in the industrial marketplace. It is distinguished for its compact size, high output volume and easy maintenance requirements. As an industry-grade air compressor, it is built with high-quality components designed to supply a consistent flow of compressed air and run 24-7 even without an interval. Its structure is also what allows it to meet different requirements to further improve performance and energy efficiency. How Rotary Air Compressor Works there are several types of rotary air compressors and they are classified based on their stage, cooling method, energy, consumption, pressure requirements and whether it is oil lubricated or oil free. The single stage, oil injected models are by far the most employed in every industry and for the purpose of this article, we will be focusing on this type of air compressor. Compression the name behind the rotary air compressor is derived from the two counter-rotating screws installed in a chamber called air rain. It works by pulling in air from the environment which travels through a filter to trap any damaging particles and debris. Once filtered, the air then travels through an inlet valve and into the space between the screws. As the rotors turn, the air also moves along and goes through the other end of the compressor. In the process, the vessel that holds the air gets increasingly smaller, thus increasing the pressure and compressing the air. This process is continuous to ensure a high volume, constant stream of compressed air. It also eliminates the chances of pulsing or surging which typically occur with piston compressors. Screw Compressor the screw compressor uses a pair of helical rotors where it traps and compresses the gas as the rotors revolve in the cylinder. In HVAC, they are usually used in systems with 20-ton capacity and above. The male rotor and the female rotor are built inside the cylinder. The low-pressure refrigerant enters one end of the compressor and the resultant high-pressure refrigerant is discharged into the opposite end to the condenser centrifugal compressor centrifugal compressor is usually used in large capacity refrigerating system in this compressor the vapor is moved in a circular motion known as centrifugal force an impeller which is a disc with radial blade spins rapidly inside this housing causing the gas to gain velocity a diffuser converts this energy into pressure energy and is then discharged into the condenser. The pumping efficiency increases with speed, hence this type of compressors are designed to operate at high speed. The main advantage of centrifugal compressor is that there are no valves, pistons or cylinders. The wearing parts that need attention are the main bearings. Condenser specifications. Types of condensers. 1. Air-cooled condensers. A. Natural convection type. B. Forced convection type. 2. Water-cooled condensers. A. Double pipe or tube in tube type. B. Shell and coil type. C. Shell and tube type. 3. Evaporative condensers. Expansion valve specifications. 1. Thermostatic expansion valve. 2. Manual valves. 3. Capillary tubes. 4. Automatic valves. 5. Electronic expansion valves. 6. Low pressure float valves. 7. High pressure float valves. As per site, we have electronic expansion valve for screw chiller and high pressure valve expansion for centrifugal chiller. Electronic expansion valve. Electronic expansion valves are an evolution on the thermal expansion valve. They are much more sophisticated and allow the refrigeration system to operate much more accurately and efficiently.
The key to the increase in efficiency is due to their ability to control superheat to a low, stable setting. The electric expansion valve has the ability to follow load, in most cases, from about 5 to 115 percent of nominal load. In addition, flash gas in the liquid line is less damaging to the operation of the system because the relatively large port and large stroke of the EXV allows them to open wide, purge the flash gas, and then re-establish the desired superheat. High Pressure Float Expansion Valve It used as an expansion device for flooded systems. The high pressure float valve is located on the high pressure side of the system and is in open connection to the condenser. It controls the evaporator level indirectly by maintaining a constant level of refrigerant inside the float chamber. The evaporator level therefore depends on the total refrigerant charge of the system and must be adjusted to the system. If the charge is too great, it will lead to excessive flooding of the evaporator, while if the charge is too small it will lead to starvation. Evaporator specifications. Types of evaporators. Bare tube evaporators. Plate type of evaporators. Finned evaporators. Shell and tube types of evaporators. As per site we have shell and tube type evaporator for both. Screw and centrifugal chiller. The shell and tube types of evaporators are used in the large refrigeration and central air conditioning systems. The evaporators in these systems are commonly known as the chillers. The chillers comprise of large number of the tubes that are inserted inside the drum or the shell. Depending on the direction of the flow of the refrigerant in the shell and tube type of chillers, they are classified into two types, dry expansion type and flooded type of chillers. In dry expansion chillers the refrigerant flows along the tube side and the fluid to be chilled flows along the shell side. The flow of the refrigerant to these chillers is controlled by the expansion valve. In case of the flooded type of evaporators the Refrigerant flows along the shell side and fluid to be chilled flows along the tube. Oil pump specifications. Oil pump. The oil pump forces the oil to mix into a return oil stream where it then enters the heat exchanger, usually of plate or shell. And tube type design, where either refrigerant or cooling water also enters the heat exchanger to remove any unwanted heat. To maintain a specified supply oil temperature, the oil is then sent up to the top of the compressor and will usually pass through an oil filter before entering a small oil reservoir. The filter helps to prevent foreign particles entering the moving components as these will damage the machine. The reservoir provides an emergency supply. If the chiller suddenly lost electrical power, the oil pump would be unable to provide lubrication oil while the machine slowed down. The reservoir therefore provides a gravity-fed supply of oil during this period, until the rotating components have came to a complete stop. From the reservoir the oil is distributed to a few key components. In one stream the oil is sprayed as a fine mist over the drive. Transmission gears which ensures an even coat of oil. In another stream the oil is forced at high pressure onto the bearings and thrust bearings. It needs to be under high pressure to ensure it enters into all the small gaps and covers all the surfaces. The oil from the first stream, drive transmission, is then usually collected in a reservoir and sent back to the vessel so the sump pump can continue to force oil around the system. The oil from the second stream, bearings, is typically collected and sent straight back to the heat exchanger as it will be much hotter so needs to be cooled. As mentioned earlier, another stream is sometimes also used to control the position of the vane guides. The chiller with use. The pressure of the oil system to hydraulically move their position. 
oil pump lubrication cycle. The oil pump, oil filter, and oil cooler make up a package located partially in the transmission casing of the compressor motor. Assembly The oil is pumped into a filter assembly to remove foreign particles and is then forced into an oil cooler heat. Exchanger where the oil is cooled to proper operational temperatures. After the oil cooler, part of the flow is directed to the gears and the high speed shaft bearings the remaining flow is directed to the motor shaft bearings oil drains into the transmission oil sump to complete the cycle oil is charged into the lubrication system through a hand valve two side glasses in the oil reservoir permit oil level observation normal oil level is between the middle of the upper side glass and the top of the lower side glass when the compressor is shut down the oil level should be visible in at least one of the two side glasses during operation oil sump temperature is displayed on the cvc icvc chiller visual controller international chiller visual controller default screen during compressor operation the oil sump temperature ranges between 125 to 150 f 52 to 66 c the oil pump suction is fed from the oil reservoir an oil pressure relief valve maintains 18 to 25 sit 124 to 172 k part differential pressure in the system at the pump discharge this differential pressure can be read directly from the CVC ICVC default screen. The oil pump thus charges oil to the oil filter assembly. This filter can be closed to permit removal of the filter without draining the entire oil system. The oil is then piped to the oil cooler heat exchanger. The oil cooler uses refrigerant from the condenser as the coolant. The refrigerant cools the oil to a temperature between 120 and 140 F 49 to 60 C. As the oil leaves the oil cooler, it passes the oil pressure transducer and the thermal bulb for the refrigerant expansion valve on. The oil cooler. The oil is then divided. Part of the oil flows to the thrust bearing, forward pinion bearing, and gear spray. The rest of the oil lubricates the motor shaft bearings in the rear pinion bearing. The oil temperature is measured in the bearing housing as it leaves the thrust and forward journal bearings. The oil then drains into the oil reservoir at the base of the compressor. The PIC2 product integrated control tube measures the temperature of the oil in the sump and maintains the temperature during shutdown. This temperature is read on the CVC ICVC default screen. During the chiller startup, the PIC2 energizes the oil pump and provides 45 seconds of pre lubrication to the bearings after. Pressure is verified before starting the compressor. During shutdown, the oil pump will run for 60 seconds to post lubricate after. The compressor shuts down. The oil pump can also be energized for testing purposes during a control test. If the controls are subject to a power failure that lasts more than 3 hours, the oil pump will be energized periodically when the power is restored. This helps to eliminate refrigerant that has migrated to the oil sump during the power failure. The controls Energize the pump for 60 seconds every 30 minutes until the chiller is started. Guide vanes. Inlet guide vanes provide an efficient method of turndown for centrifugal compressors. Guide vanes not only provide the inlet pressure drop but also impart a whirl motion to the gas as it enters the compressor impeller. It is this whirl motion that results in energy savings at the design conditions. Economizer specification. An economizer is a type of subcooler that uses part of the total refrigerant flow from the condenser to cool the rest of the refrigerant flow. The evaporated refrigerant then enters the compressor at an intermediate pressure level. 
the coal gas from the economizer can also be used to provide extra cooling for the compressor the subcooling of the main refrigerant flow reduces the quality of the inlet vapor to the evaporator which increases the cooling capacity the high efficiency of the economizer minimizes the required temperature difference between the sub cooling and the evaporating streams which in turn increases the overall efficiency of the system inspect the condenser and evaporator tubes evaporator inspect and clean the cooler tubes at the end of the first operating season because these tubes have internal ridges a rotary type tube cleaning system is needed to fully clean the tubes inspect the tubes condition to determine the schedule frequency for future cleaning and to determine whether water treatment in the chilled water brine circuit is adequate inspect the entering and leaving chilled water temperature sensors and flow devices for signs of corrosion or scale replace a sensor or shred of fitting if corroded or remove any scale if found condenser since this water circuit is usually an open type system the tubes may be subject to contamination and scale clean the condenser tubes with a rotary tube cleaning system at least once per year and more often if the water is contaminated inspect the entering and leaving condenser water sensors and flow devices for signs of corrosion or scale replace the sensor or shred of fitting if corroded or remove any scale if found higher than normal condenser pressures together with the inability to reach full refrigeration load usually indicate dirty tubes or air in the chiller if the refrigeration log indicates a rise above normal condenser pressures check the condenser refrigerant temperature against the leaving condenser water temperature if this reading is more than what the design difference is supposed to be the condenser tubes may be dirty or water flow may be incorrect because hfc 134a is a high pressure refrigerant air usually does not enter the chiller during the tube cleaning process use brushes specially designed to avoid scraping and scratching the tube wall muffler most refrigeration systems require mufflers to reduce noise due to gas pulsations in compressor suction and discharge lines muffler prevents the hot gas pulsation that occur in the compressor from carrying noise and vibration through the system and the objects it affects noise and vibration that has not dampened may actually increase after leaving the compressor noise can become quiet and annoying people more importantly the system components and pipelines can be damaged by prolonged vibration filter dryer specification a filter dryer in a refrigeration or air conditioning system has two essential functions one to absorb system contaminants such as water which can create acids and two to provide physical filtration the ability to remove water content from a refrigeration system is the most important function of a dryer water can come from many sources such as trapped air from improper evacuation system leaks and motor windings another source is due to improper handling of polyester pore lubricants which are hygroscopic that is they readily absorb moisture POEs can pick up more moisture from their surroundings and hold it much tighter than the previously used mineral oils. This water can cause freeze ups and corrosion of metallic components. To prevent the formation of these acids, the water within the system must be minimized. This is accomplished by the use of desiccants within the filter dryer. The three most commonly used desiccants are molecular sieve, activated alumina, and silica. Gel oil filter. The function of an oil filter dryer is to remove both system dust particles and moisture from the refrigerant oil. Their purpose: 
is to protect compressors and oil level regulators from damage. Control panel specification. The chiller equipped with a star delta starter mounted on the unit. This starter is used with low voltage motors under 600 versus. It reduces the starting current inrush by connecting each phase of the motor windings into a Y configuration. This occurs during the starting period when the motor is accelerating up to speed. Once the motor is up to speed, the starter automatically connects the phase windings into a delta configuration. Starter control, monitoring, and motor protection is provided by Carrier's Integrated Starter Module, ICVC Board Specification, ICVC Board. Inputs, inputs on strips J3 through J6 are analog inputs and J2 is discrete, on, off, input. The specific application of the chiller determines which terminals are used. Refer to the individual chiller wiring diagram for the correct terminal numbers for your application. Outputs, outputs are 115 to 277 VAC and wire to strip J9. There are two terminals per output. CCM board specification. Chiller control module, CCM. Inputs, each input channel has two or three terminals. Refer to individual chiller wiring diagrams for the correct terminal numbers. For your application. Outputs, output is 24 VAC. There are two terminals per output. Refer to the chiller wiring diagram for your specific application. For the correct terminal numbers. Control module error. The CVC, ICVC, CCM, and ISM modules perform continuous diagnostic evaluations of the hardware to determine its condition. Proper operation of all modules is indicated by LEDs, light emitting diodes, located on the circuit board of the CVC, ICVC, CCM, and ISM. There is one green LED located on the CCM and ISM boards respectively, and one red LED located on the CVC, ICVC, CCM, and ISM boards respectively. Red LED, labeled as STAT, if the red LED blinks continuously at a two-second interval, the module is operating properly. Is lit continuously, there is a problem that requires replacing the module. Is off continuously, the power should be checked. Blinks three times per second, a software error has been discovered and the module must be replaced. If there is no input power, check the fuses and circuit breaker. If the fuse is good, check for a shorted secondary of the transformer or, if power is present to the module, replace the module. Read LED, labeled as COM, these LEDs indicate the communication status between different parts of the controller and the network modules and should blink continuously. Control module operation. The chiller operator monitors and modifies configurations in the microprocessor by using the four soft keys in the communications between the CVC, ICVC and the CCM is accomplished through the CO sensor input output bus, which is a phone cable. The communication between the CCM and ISM is accomplished through the sensor bus, which is a three-wire cable. If a green LED is on continuously, check the communication wiring. If a green LED is off, check the red LED operation. If the red LED is normal, check the module address switches SW1 confirm all. Switches are in off position. All system operating intelligence resides I and the some safety shutdown logic resides in the ISM in case communications are lost between TE ISM and CVC ICVC. Outputs are controlled by the CCM and ISM as well. Power is supplied to the modules within the control panel via 24 watt power sources. The transformers are located within the power panel 
with the exception of the ism, which operates from a 115 watt power source and has its own 24 watt transformer located in the module. In the power panel, T1 supplies power to the compressor oil heater, oil pump, and optional hot gas bypass, and T2 supplies power to both the CVC, ICVC, and CCM. Power is connected to plug J1 on each module. Screw chiller control module. Main baseboard MVB. The MVB is the core of the Comfort Link control system. It contains the major portion of operating software and controls the operation of the machine. Main baseboard MVB. The MVB continuously monitors input-output channel information received from its inputs and from all other modules. The MVB receives inputs from status and feedback switches, pressure transducers and thermistors. The MVB also controls several outputs. Some inputs and outputs that control the chiller are located on other boards, but are transmitted to or from the MVB via the internal communications bus. Information is transmitted between modules via three-wire communication bus or length local equipment network. The CCN carrier comfort network bus is also supported. Compressor protection module, CPM. There is one CPM per compressor. The device controls the compressor contactors, oil solenoid, loading and unloading solenoids. The CPM also monitors the compressor motor. Temperature, high pressure switch, oil level switch, discharge gas temperature, oil pressure transducer, motor current. MTA must trip amps setting an economizer pressure transducer. The CPM responds to commands from the MVB main baseboard and sends the MVB the results of the channels it monitors via the length local equipment network. The CPM has three deep switch input banks, switch 1, S1, switch 2, S2 and switch 3, S3. The CPM board deep switch S1 configures the board for the type of starter, the location and type of the current transformers and contactor failure instructions. Compressor protection module. The CPM board deep switch S2 setting determines the must trip amps MTA setting. See Appendix D for deep switch settings. The MTA setting which is calculated using the settings too must match the MTA setting in the software or an MTA alarm will be generated. Electronic expansion valve, EXV board. The screw chiller have one EXV board per circuit. The board is responsible for monitoring the suction gas temperature and economizer gas temperature thermistors. The board also signals the main EXV and economizer XV, EC, EXV motors to open or close. The electronic expansion valve board responds to commands from the MVB and sends the MVB the results of the channels it monitors via the length local equipment network. Control module communication. Red LED proper operation of the control boards can be visually checked by looking at the red status LEDs light emitting diodes. When operating correctly, the red status LEDs will blink in unison at a rate of once every two seconds. If the red LEDs are not blinking in unison, verify that correct power is being supplied to all modules. We show that the main base board MBB is supplied with the current software. If necessary, reload current software. If the problem still persists, replace the MBB. A red LED that is lit continuously or blinking at a rate of once per second or faster indicates that the board should be replaced. Green LED. All boards have a green LEN LED which should be blinking whenever power is on. If the LEDs are not blinking as described, check LEN connections for potential communication errors at the board connectors. 
See input output tables 3 to 10 for LEN connector designations. A3 wire bus accomplishes communication between modules. These three wires run in parallel from module to module. The J9A connector on. The MVB provides communication directly to the navigator display module. Yellow LED The MVB has one yellow LED. The carrier comfort network CCN LED will blink during times of network communication. High pressure safety switch. These pressure switches are located at the discharge of each compressor. A high pressure switch HPS is protective devices for the compressor and refrigeration circuit. High pressure switch with manual reset. Moisture indicator. Located on the EXV, permits control of the unit charge and indicates moisture in the circuit. The presence of bubbles in the side glass indicates an insufficient charge or non-condensable in the system. The presence of moisture changes the color of the indicator paper in the side glass. Sensors. The units use thermistors to measure the temperature and pressure transducers to control and regulate system operation. Pump specifications. Electric motor. An electric motor is an electrical machine that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. Most electric motors operate through the interaction between the motor's magnetic field and electric current in a wire winding to generate force in the form of rotation of a shaft. Types of motors. 1. AC motors. 2. DC motors. AC motors. These are the types of motor that are further classified into two categories such as below. Synchronous motor. Conduction motor. Conduction motor are the ones that are further classified into following. A. Single phase motor. B. Three phase motor. Conduction motor. An induction motor, also known as an asynchronous motor, is a commonly used AC electric motor. In an induction motor, the electric current in the rotor needed to produce torque is obtained via electromagnetic induction from the rotating magnetic field of the stator winding. The rotor of an induction motor can be a squirrel cage rotor or boon type rotor. Single phase induction motor. The types of single phase induction motors. 1. Split phase induction motor. 2. Capacitor start induction motor. 3. Capacitor start and capacitor run induction motor. 4. Shaded pole induction motor. 3 phase induction motor. The types of 3 phase induction motors. 1. Squirrel cage induction motor. 2. Slip ring induction motor. Three phase induction motor self starting. In a three phase motor, there are three single phase lines with a 120 degrees phase difference. So the rotating magnetic field has the same phase difference which will make the rotor to move. If we consider three phases A, B, and C when phaser gets magnetized, the rotor will move towards the phaser winding A. In the next moment phase B will get magnetized and it will attract the rotor and then phase C. So the rotor will continue to rotate. Squirrel cage induction motor. A three-phase squirrel cage induction motor is a type of three-phase induction motor which functions based on the principle of electromagnetism. It is called a squirrel cage motor because the rotor inside of it known as a squirrel cage rotor looks like a squirrel cage squirrel cage induction motor construction rotor it is the part of the motor which will be in a rotation to give mechanical output for a given amount of electrical energy the rated output of the motor is mentioned on the nameplate in horsepower it consists of a shaft short circuit copper, aluminum bars, and a core. The rotor core is laminated to avoid power loss from eddy currents and hysteresis. 
Stator. The stator is the stationary part of the motor's electromagnetic circuit and usually consists of either windings or permanent magnets. The stator core is made up of many thin metal sheets, called laminations. Laminations are used to reduce energy losses that would result if a solid core were used. It consists of a three-phase winding with a core and metal housing. Windings are such placed that they are electrically and mechanically 120 degree apart from in space. The winding is mounted on the laminated iron core to provide low reluctance path for generated flux by AC currents. Fan. A fan is attached to the back side of the rotor to provide heat exchange, and hence it maintains the temperature of the motor. Under a limit. Earrings. Bearings are provided as the base for rotor motion, and the bearings keep the smooth rotation of the motor. Motor control. Fixed speed control AC motors are provided with direct online or soft start starters. Variable speed controlled AC motors are provided with a range of different power inverter, variable frequency drive or electronic commutator technologies. The term electronic commutator is usually associated with self-commutated brushless DC motor and switch reluctance. Motor applications. Primary pumps. The primary pump is used to circulate chilled water in a closed system. The chilled water pump circulates return chilled water from the air handling units and fan coil units back to the chiller. The chilled water pump circulates chilled water through the system. Secondary pumps. The chilled water pump is used to circulate chilled water in a closed system. The chilled water pump circulates supply chilled water to the air handling units and fan coil units back to the primary pumps. The chilled water pump circulates chilled water through the system. Condenser pumps. Condenser water pumps are used for supplying condenser heated water cooling tower and return cooled water to condenser. Inlet. The condenser water pump is used to circulate heat water to cooled water in a closed system. Introduction. A pump is a machine used to move liquid through a piping system and to raise the pressure of the liquid. It is a hydraulic machine which converts mechanical energy into hydraulic energy. Pump can be classified into three major groups according to the method they use to move the fluid, direct lift, displacement and gravity pump. Pump can be classified into two categories. Positive displacement pumps. Non-positive displacement pumps. Positive displacement pump can operate by forcing a fixed volume of fluid from inlet pressure section of the pump into the discharge zone of the pump. It can be classified into two types. Rotary type positive displacement pump. Internal gear pump. Screw pump. Reciprocating type positive displacement pump. Piston pump, diaphragm pump, non-positive displacement pump. With this pump, the volume of the liquid delivered for each cycle depends on the resistance offered to flow. A. Pump produces a force on the liquid that is constant for each particular speed of the pump. Resistance in a discharge line produces a force in the opposite direction. When these forces are equal, a liquid is in a state of equilibrium and does not flow. If the outlet of a non-positive displacement pump is completely closed, the discharge pressure will rise to maximum for a pump operating at a maximum speed. A non-positive displacement pump can be classified as follow. Centrifugal pump. A centrifugal pump is a rotodynamic pump that uses a rotating impeller to increase the pressure and flow rate of a fluid. Centrifugal pump are most common type of pump used to move liquids through a piping system. The fluid enters the pump impeller along or near to the rotating axis and it is accelerated by the impeller, flowing radially outward or axially. 
into a diffuser or volute chamber, from where it exits into the downstream piping system. Centrifugal pump are typically used for large discharge through smaller heads. Centrifugal pump are often associated with the radial flow type. However, the term centrifugal pump can be used to describe all impeller type rotodynamic pumps including the radial, axial and mixed flow variations. Radial Mixed and axial flow pump belongs to a class of machines known as rotodynamic. Radial flow pump. The fluid that enters along the axial plane is accelerated by the impeller and exits at right angles to the shaft. Radially. Radial flow pump operate at higher pressures and lower flow rates than axial and mixed flow pumps.